Swimming deep in the ocean, me fin we the dolphin. Always on the lookout for records that have been forgotten. From old advertising jingles and budget harmonies, Finley will share them all and dive into the mystery. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Bela Lugosi, playing the part of Professor Antonio Basile, psychologist. The story is by J. Donald Wilson, who calls it, The Doctor Prescribed Death. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. This series of tales is calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with the doctor prescribed death and Bela Lugosi's performance, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. Professor Antonio Basile has a theory, but let him tell you about it. As a psychologist, I have worked out a theory. A theory I know to be sound. I contend that a person who has decided to kill himself can very easily be turned from this desire to the desire of taking the life of another. I can prove my theory. And if necessary, that is exactly what I will do. Yes, Professor Antonio Basile has a theory, but only a theory. And he's worried about what his publisher will say. So he visits the editor, whose name is Hellman. Hellman finishes the manuscript and tosses it on the desk. Professor Basile leans forward eagerly and... Well, Hellman, what do you think? Professor Basile, it's purely conjecture, simply a theory, and I wouldn't advise publishing it. I worked on that theory for a long time. I'm positive of it. I know it'll work. Suppose it will. What good is it? What good have you accomplished if you can prove it'll work? <laughs> Are you laughing at me, Hellman? <laughs> it's so silly. An ordinary human being has suffered reverses. is sick of it all. He wants to leave it all behind. And you say he can be changed to want to kill someone else. I do. Self-destruction and the destruction of other life are closely related in the mind. The dividing line is very thin. It's ridiculous. And you won't publish it? Ranger would fire me. Why? He told me that in his opinion you should be in the asylum. Mr. Granger said that. Does he think I'm insane? <laughs> How do I know? <laughs> Hellman, Mr. Granger didn't say that. It's you who thinks I'm crazy. You've never liked me. For some reason, you are trying to tear me down. Well, we'll see, Mr. Hellman. We'll see. Now, wait a minute. I'll show you whether my works are illogical. I'll show you whether I'm insane. Oh, calm down. <laughs> I'm going to make you eat those words. I know you don't like me, but I'm going to prove that my theory is sound. Good night. Wait a minute. Basil, wait. You wait, Hellman. You wait. Yes, wait, Hellman. Wait. Professor Basile, seething with resentment, rushes from the office and strides angrily down the street. Insane, huh? I'll prove my theory. I'll find the subject. I'll find someone who wants to take his own life. And so Basile goes home, late for dinner. He finds a note from his wife, Myra, 
saying she's decided to attend the opera and will be home around 11.30. Then Professor Basile gets an inspiration. He goes to the bridge over the deep canyon, the bridge called Suicide. And strangely enough, he hasn't long to wait. As he stands against the railing in the fog, a figure appears a few feet beyond, stops, prepares to leap. Don't do it! Wait a minute! Listen. Huh? That's very silly. Let go of me. Oh, no. I couldn't do that. I need you. I don't need you. Don't you know this is uh, against the law? You're not an officer. You can't stop me. It's 500 feet to those tracks below. Hard steel rails. And don't believe what they all tell you about not being conscious of what happened. You'd know. People don't die instantly. Let loose. They lie in agony for minutes and sometimes for an hour. It's a horrible death, I know. How do you know? I'm a doctor. Doctor? Yes. I can tell you much simpler ways, much less painful ways and quicker. You're a nice young girl, an intelligent girl. You wouldn't want it to happen this way. Maybe after I talk to you a while, you wouldn't want to do this at all. No. No. But come on. Let's talk it over. Maybe a few minutes talk will change the entire picture for you. What could you do to help me? If you'll come, I'll tell you. There's a motive back of your wanting to do this, and I'd like to know what it is. Nothing doing. Haven't you any relatives? Any loved ones you'd like to do something for? Yes. Then if you'll talk with me for a while... Maybe I can find my way clear to help those people. You sound crazy to oh, me. Oh, no. All right, Otto. Where? My apartment. Let's go. Well, here we are. Come in, please. Well, what do you want to know? Uh, sit down first. Are you hungry? No, I'm not that broke. It isn't poverty. I knew that. I could tell by your clothes. Yes. Now, first, why did you come here? Why? Why, because you talked me into it. I <laughs> see. You're not afraid of me? Afraid? In my frame of mind. What could I lose? Suppose I told you that I really brought you here to kill you. Kill me? <laughs> uh, you know, you're a very pretty girl, don't you? Yeah. That doesn't always mean so much. To the right man, it might. That's what I thought. But I found out it didn't mean a thing. Ah. Then it was because of a man. I knew it. Really? How did you guess? I'm a student of psychology. I'm Professor Antonio Basile. I see. And you want to know what makes me tick? You want to know the reason behind my action tonight? That's right. I would like to know what happened to make you want to kill yourself. Suicide is a mental aberration. Yeah? I'd like to know what preceded the decision to destroy yourself. And what you thought about until the moment I stopped you on the bridge. What good will that do me? You said you weren't broke. But you also said you had some loved ones you'd like to do something for. I meant I wasn't broke to the point of being hungry. I have a few dollars. But you suggested help for someone in larger terms. Yes, I did. Who is the loved one? My mother. You are her only means of support? Yes. And you intend to kill yourself? Yes. That's being selfish, isn't it? Selfish? Yes. You are concentrating solely on self. You think so? But what else? The first law of human nature is self-preservation, right? I suppose so. The second law is the preservation of family. Yeah. So you decide to deny the first law and destroy yourself. And as a consequence, deny the second and leave your mother alone and in need. You indicate a form of insanity. What would be normal? To destroy the other person. The one who has done you wrong. Have you hurt him? No. Then the one who has done wrong should be the one to suffer. You have no legal recourse? Legal recourse? No, I haven't, I'm sorry to say. 
and you would kill yourself to let your poor mother suffer because of the wrong of another. Why shouldn't he be the one to suffer? I suppose you're right. Why shouldn't he? What happened after all? Why not tell me about it? Were you married? No. He never seemed to find time to get a wrong marriage. What's your name? Gladys. Gladys Tanner. How long had you known him? Almost four years. And you always thought he meant to marry you? Yes. Until three weeks ago. Yes? On July 1st, he had to leave town for a week on business. He said he was going to Kansas City. When he came back, he seemed to be too busy to see me. Then a week ago, I found a snapshot along with several others in his desk in his home. May I see it? Certainly. It's a picture of him and another woman. But the picture was not taken in Kansas City. It was? No. It was taken on the beach at Atlantic City. And it's dated by the finisher, July 3rd. Since he returned, he's refused to see me. Yesterday, he finally said he didn't care to see me anymore. That I'd better forget him. But it isn't so easy as that, is it? No. I figured I'd done something. And blame myself. Do you... Uh, do you know this blonde woman in this uh, snapshot? No. Then it must be a woman uh, he has met uh, recently. You've known him for, for four years. I don't think you are to blame. He's the one in the wrong. And he should be made to suffer. How? You were going to kill yourself. Why should you? Kill him instead. He double-crossed you. He deserves it. Now, let me go a little deeper into the situation. Whenever a person has reached the conclusion to take his life... sure you have made up your mind, Miss Tanner? Positive. Now, if you're careful, you won't be caught. No. But whether you are or not, I'm giving you this check for a thousand dollars made out to cash to be sent to your mother only after the man is dead. Write his name on this pad. There you are. I will know what has happened by the newspapers. And I will be told payment... Until I learn that you have gone through with it. It'll happen tonight. Very well. You are sure? You are determined? Absolutely. Nothing could stop me. Very good. But just what would happen if I did get caught? You won't get caught if you follow my instructions. I know. Now, here is a small revolver. It'll fit easily in your purse. That's all you need. Be sure to wipe your fingerprints off and leave the gun near the body. Yeah. Well, goodbye, Dr. Basile. Goodbye, Gladys, and good luck. Professor Basile watches Gladys as she crosses the street to the dimly lighted bus stop. Then he rushes to his car and drives away. A few minutes later, he comes to a stop at Hellman's house. Hellman, the editor who ridiculed his theory. Just a minute. Oh. Hello, Basil. Good evening, Hellman. Thought I'd drop out to have a little chat with you. Well, why this time of night? It's kind of late, isn't it? Eleven. Didn't think that was late for you. No? Uh, come in. Thanks. Sit down. What's on your mind? I want to talk to you about my theory you ridiculed so definitely. My theory about suicide. Oh. Well, I just don't believe it, that's all. And I said I'd prove it, didn't I? Yes, but what are you getting at? It's going to be proved. My theory is going to be proved tonight. Oh, well, that's fine. Go right ahead and prove it. I don't like you, Hellman. I'd never liked you. 
And I know you don't like me. I can't help that, Basile. What are you staring at? Is there someone here with you? Certainly not. Why? That's a woman's purse under Davenport. Hmm? Oh, my secretary dropped by earlier this evening with the manuscript. She must have forgotten it. She's not here now? Of course not. Then I'll continue. I found a subject. A girl who was ready to commit suicide because a man jilted her. In a few hours, I was successful in changing her thoughts from suicide to homicide. And she is going to kill the man tonight. What do you think of that? There may be a dozen murders tonight. Ah, but you know which one I mean. You know about this murder. What do you mean? Because I'm going to tell you who the victim is going to be. You know who the intended victim is? Why don't you stop it? <laughs> but then I wouldn't have proved my theory. If you put this girl up to it, you're as guilty as she is. <laughs> you're insane, Basile, hopelessly insane. You think so, am I? The whole idea is mad, too utterly ridiculous for words. <laughs> No sane man would ever think of such a useless, senseless idea. And for heaven's sake, stop laughing. I'm thinking about the victim when he learns. Who is the victim? Martin Harriman. Me? Yes, you. <laughs> I don't believe you. You will this time. Who is this girl? I know no girl who'd want to kill me. This one does. Now. Oh, nonsense. However, I wouldn't put a past you to hire someone to do something like this. Oh, no. This girl is no fake. This girl is serious, deadly serious. You probably hypnotized some poor woman, figuring she'd never remember what happened. Oh, Herman, you underestimate me. Maybe I do underestimate your evil mind. But believe me... Put up your hands, Herman. Get away from the desk. I'll just take care of that gun, Herman. That's better. Well, since when did you start carrying a gun, Basile? I a gun? Don't be silly. This isn't a gun in my pocket. It's just my pipe. See? <laughs> well, what do you hear, Herman? Uh, nothing. Oh, yes, you do. I heard it too. A sound on the porch. I leave now. The back way. I put your gun in the kitchen. And I'll be very careful to remove all my... You insane fool. Oh, fancy you. You, Herman, you are going to help prove my theory. <laughs> Good night, Herman. Crazy devil. I'll have him locked up before he gets across town. Good evening, Mr. Hellman. Huh? How did you get in here? Through the patio door. What do you want? I wanted to talk to you. Not very strangely. <laughs> You're just imagining things. And what are you doing here? I wanted to tell you something. Yeah? What? When you first indicated to me that you were through with me, I was terribly hurt. I thought all along that we were to be married. I couldn't understand. I tried and tried to think of something I'd done to cause our breakup. Then I happened to find this snapshot in your desk. Snapshot? Take a look at it. Kansas City. No, Atlantic City, New Jersey. You and a blonde. And the date is stamped on the back. A business trip. Ha! Huh. Well, what about it? I just wanted you to know that you weren't so slick. I wanted you to know that I knew about the blonde... But I knew you'd lied. Now that you've told me, what good does it do you? A lot of good. First, I thought you came here for money. How could you think such a thing? Well, I think you'd better go now. <laughs> I'm going. Goodbye, Morton. And good luck in your new venture. What venture? This one. Gladys. Gladys! Wish me luck in mine. Gladys stands staring a moment at the body of Hellman, then wipes off the gun, drops it to the floor, takes the professor's check from her purse, steps to Hellman's desk and writes a note. Then she puts the note in an envelope with the check, addresses it, stamps it, turns out the lights, 
steps out into the dark street. At the corner, she drops the envelope in the mailbox and disappears. Professor Basile heard the shots. His theory worked. Hellman will torment him no more. The perfect crime. So he can go home to his wife now and go to sleep. Myra. Myra. Huh? What? Oh, oh, Antonio. What are you doing asleep on the Davenport? Do you know what time it is? It must be after midnight. I've been waiting for you. How was the opera? Oh, fair. Nothing to brag about. Who sang the lead? Bill Chiotti. He wasn't very good. Bill Chiotti? Mm-hmm. He's a poor Othello. Othello? I thought they were uh, doing Ida tonight. No, they switched because someone was ill. Oh, I just as soon have stayed home. Have a night, Capmira? No, thanks. I'm tired. I think I'll go to bed. I belong presently. Good night. Then the night passes and the morning comes. Professor rises cheerfully and prepares for breakfast. Then... I get it, Myra. Yes? Are you Professor Basile? Yes. May we come in? We'd like to talk with you. Of course. What is it you want? Is your wife in? Yes. We'd like to see her, too. What? Oh, I'm Lieutenant Davis. Detective, that's Well... What do you want? Will you call your wife? Why? And suddenly. Myra! But what is this all about? What is it, Antonio? These men are from detective headquarters. They want to talk to us. Really? What about? May I ask where you were last night, Mrs. Basile? Certainly. I went to the opera. And what time did you get home? Oh, I imagine it was around 11 or shortly after. Mm-hmm. Were you at home last evening, Professor? Well, I was at the club and got home about 12.30. By the way, uh, do you know a Morton Hellman? Certainly. What about him? He's been murdered. Murdered? Good Lord. When? Around midnight last night. I found him this morning. How terrible. Why, I've known him for years. He was editor-in-chief of the company publishing my writings. I'm a psychologist, you know. Yes, we know. But, uh... What do you want to know from us? We weren't connected socially with Hellman. Uh, just in business. Did uh, you know him, Mrs. Basile? Yes, yes, I knew him very slightly. Do either of you know of anyone who'd have reason to kill him? Uh, certainly not. Everyone thought highly of him. Did you ever hear of a girl named Gladys Tanner? Gladys Tanner? No. Did you know of a Gladys Tanner, Mrs. Basile? No. Is this your purse, Mrs. Basile? Why, of course it is. That's the one I gave you last Christmas, Myra. Oh, yes. I must have lost it downtown. Where did you find it, Lieutenant? At Hellman's home. Hellman's home? Well, how in the world... Good heavens, but We how... found it on the sofa. Well, I can't imagine how it could get there. And this is the revolver that killed Hellman, found on the floor beside him. What? No fingerprints on it, however. What? May what? I see it? Why, Myra, this is your gun. I bought this for you two years ago... When I went on the lecture tour. Yes, I think it's mine, but it just doesn't make sense. Did you have the gun in your purse when you lost it last night? Well, I... Perhaps I did. I, I'm so confused now, I can't remember. I think, Myra. I think it is, it is terrible. Oh, I know. Oh, dear, I feel ill. Did you ever fire this gun? Yes, once last year up in the mountains. I, I wanted to see how it worked. Ever reloaded? No, I've never reloaded it. I, I just didn't think about it. But maybe I did put it in my purse... Why, I don't know, and, and whoever found the purse may have used the gun to... Oh, I just can't seem to think... This gun misfired on the first two shots. The other three killed Hellman. This is the most amazing piece of coincidence I ever heard of. Why would my wife want to do such a thing? Why should she get to Hellman? She hardly knew him. Are you sure about that, Professor? Of course. Well, sorry to say that I don't believe her. What? What? This is ridiculous. This is going to be a shock to you, Professor, but here's a snapshot we found on Hellman's desk. Taken in Atlantic City last July. Good heavens. Why? This is you, Myra. You and Hellman. You were at your mother's in Florida in July. (laughs) Myra, look at me. What does this mean? I can't. I can't. 
And I can't believe such a thing. May I have the purse, the gun, and the photo? Thank you. I'm sorry, but I'll have to take her down to headquarters. But I didn't kill him. I didn't. I wouldn't. I loved him. <laughs> Myra. You better pull yourself together. You'll have to go back. We'll want photos and fingerprints. Yes. You better get it ready, Myra. <laughs> Certainly looks bad for her. Great it does. Looks like an open and shut case. Oh, uh, will you come along too, Professor? Well, certainly. And so it all worked out beautifully. Not quite as the Professor had planned. But then he changed his plan from the moment when Gladys Tanner showed him the snapshot taken in Atlantic City. And he realized that the girl's fiancé was Hellman and the blonde was Myra, his wife. He had no intention of allowing Gladys Tanner to kill Hellman until he saw that snapshot. And when he recognized Myra's purse in Hellman's home, he decided to let Gladys kill him and the blame be placed on Myra. The perfect crime. But several hours later, after fingerprints and many questions, the professor is just about to be dismissed when Sergeant Rankin steps into the room and speaks quietly to Lieutenant Davis. What is it, Rankin? I stayed at the Seal's place, as you said. Well... A few minutes ago, a special delivery letter came for the professor. This will knock your eye off. Read it. All right. Well, this fits perfectly with the writing we were trying to make out on Helm's desk letter. Professor, here's a letter sent special delivery to you a few minutes ago, postmarked last night. Read it. Dear Professor Basile, your theory worked a certain degree. You convinced me I should kill him. kill him, uh, but when that gun you gave me uh, misfired twice, I, I almost quit. Go ahead, Professor. Read on. Then as I looked at him on the floor, the feeling of self-destruction came back. I'm going ahead with my plan. Here's your check. I won't need it. Besides, I lied to you. I lost my mother long ago. Better luck next time. Gladys, Tanner. And a half hour ago, they found her body beneath Suicide Bridge. Well, Professor, your perfect crime has failed. Failed? Yes, failed. Wonderful but... setup on paper, but your theory backfired and you're up for murder. But I didn't kill him. But you planned it and you're as guilty as Gladys. She's paid her penalty, now it's your turn. No, no. I won't, I won't be hanged. Never! Drink and drink! <laughs> And now the doctor lies on the sidewalk, 17 stories below. His entire theory worked in reverse. So closes the doctor prescribed death starring Bela Lugosi. Tonight's story of suspense. It came to you from Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when we present the noted actor, Mr. Sidney Greenstreet, in The Hangman Won't Wait. Spear, the producer, Ted Bliss, the director, Lad Gluskin, the musical director, Lucian Mahwick, the composer, and J. Donald Wilson, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Once Upon a Midnight, a presentation of the American Broadcasting Company dedicated to the hearty listener who favors a tale spiced with mystery and imagination. What time is it in your house? Eight? Nine? Ten? Set the clock ahead. Make it twelve. Midnight's the time for these stories. And now here's your host, the noted director and producer, an expert guide along the path of dark adventure, Mr. Alfred Hitchcock. It was not until several weeks after he had decided to murder his wife that Dr. Bickley took any active steps in the matter. Murder is a serious business. The tiniest slip may be disastrous. And Dr. Bickley had no intention of risking disaster. This was to be the most delicately perfect of all perfect crimes. Suspense. Shock, murder, all the makings of a spine-tingling mystery drama in the hands of a past master of theatrical illusion, Alfred Hitchcock. We of the American Broadcasting Company believe this new series has the opportunity of becoming the most important and distinguished of its kind in radio. Mr. Hitchcock will appear in every program as the narrator and will personally supervise the writing and direction of each highly dramatic tale. It is our good fortune that Alfred Hitchcock has an enormous interest in radio. In fact, the idea of this series originated with him. This is important because it means we have the great asset of a star with a personal enthusiasm in making the series a true milestone in radio. The musical score is handled by Felix Mills in a new and effective way. Instead of using music simply as a bridge between scenes, each episode will be especially scored for dramatic value. The music used to make plot points to add impact to the action and sharpness to the dialogue. We feel that in every way, this new radio series offers an unusual opportunity to combine broad popular appeal with truly distinguished radio treatment. We leave it to you to judge. You were saying, Mr. Hitchcock, that uh, murder is a serious business. Oh, yes, and murderers are serious people. You know, one thing that has always fascinated me about criminals is that when you walk down a street, any passerby might be a murderer. They don't all wear black moustaches. I imagine most murderers behave just like mild, ordinary people until suddenly one day they turn and stab you in the back or drop a lump of cyanide in a friend's tea. I think this idea must have intrigued Francis Isles too, for the murderer in his story, Malice Aforethought, the Dr. Bickley I mentioned, was certainly an ordinary person, a little fellow, lightly built, around 38 I imagine, Sandy hair, a bit thin on top, small sandy moustache. You've seen him. On top of a bus, perhaps. Or you've met him on a train. Or if you'd lived near Wyvern Cross in England a few years back, you might have met him in the village, starting out on the morning rounds of his patients. Good morning, Dr. Bigley. Good morning, Mrs. Templer. Morning, Doctor. Morning, Miss Dean. Lovely morning. Lovely. Oh, Bickley. Mr. Tor, good morning. Oh, morning. Good morning, Dr. Bickley. Good morning. How's your mother? Better, thanks. Ah, splendid. Morning, Doctor. Good morning. Morning, Mrs. Cheevy. Mrs. Harvard. Lovely morning. Lovely. Listen to the way he says, lovely morning. I must say I do enjoy a cheerful murderer, although when he got home, Dr. Bickley wasn't always quite as cheery. I suppose his wife, Julia, was what you would call a battle axe. Anyway, she was a lot older than Bickley, almost an old maid type, I suppose. Probably would have been if Bickley hadn't married her. Really, Edmund, really. You might have been considerate enough to come home a little earlier, today of all days. How can Florence get on with her work if you keep her waiting to wash up your lunch things like this? Sorry, Julia. Had to get through my patience, you know. Well, of course. Do you want some more of that cold joint? Uh, just a glass of beer, I think. Edmund, you have far too much to do to sit here drinking beer. Have you forgotten we're having guests? No, my sweet. Besides, you know how beer makes you perspire. Oh, the tours will play tennis, of course. You better put the net up first. You know how it sags during the first half hour. Mm -hmm. Then there are the two tables to be taken out and the chairs. 
And I think you'd better put the awning up in this sun. And after that, you'll have to... My dear, I, uh, I don't think I should be able to get all those things done. My dear Edmund, they've got to be done. Have you finished? I'm waiting. Uh, a bit of cheese, I think. You've no time for cheese. Oh, then I suppose I'm finished. Just as well we don't give tennis parties every day, isn't it? Oh, I'm glad you mentioned it. The court will have to be rolled. What? The tennis court, Edmund. Wet it down and roll it. But then I'll have to remark all the lines. Well, of course, Edmund. But, but I don't... Now, think Edmund, don't stand there. Get about it. Dear me, it's a pity I can't be in a dozen places at once to see to everything myself. Yes, dear. Well, that was a typical day at the Bickleys. Except on this particular day, the weather and tempers were hotter than usual. Game, isn't it? Edmund, Mr. Tor has nothing to eat. Oh, here we are. Sandwich, Mr. Tor? Oh, I believe I will. Oh. And how is old Mrs. Parrott these days, Doctor? I guess she's been ailing, eh? Well, Mrs. Parrott, I might say... Edmund, well. Miss Rattery will have a sandwich. Oh, of course, Miss Rattery. Thank you, Doctor. You were asking about Mrs. Parrott. Oh, yes. Uh, as a physician, it's my opinion... Edmund, you... not there, please. Hmm? Don't sit there. That's Winfred's seat. She'll be back in a moment. Oh. Game set, Matt. Try another. Edmund, they're a ball short. Benji's hit one into the gooseberry bushes. Oh, did he? Well, go and look for it, Edmund. Don't get your guests. It's all right. I'll get it, Mrs. Bickley. No, Benji. Let Edmund. Oh, hurry, dear. Yes, dear. And so poor old Bickley put his head in the gooseberry bush looking for a tennis ball. Just as he was about to grab it with a hot and clammy hand, he heard himself a subject of conversation. Did you hear the way she ordered him about? Awful, isn't it? I'm hanged if I'd speak to a dog like that. Uh, but then I imagine a fellow like Bickley rather enjoys it, eh? <laughs> oh, Benji! <laughs> well, you know as well as I do, he didn't enjoy it, especially when people laughed. All he could do was to clench his teeth and stare down into the bush. I can't stand this. Not much longer. I can't stand it. I wish Julia were dead. I wish... I wish I could kill her. By the way, I'd like to stop a moment and tell you about a secret little weakness Bickley had. Every night he would soothe himself to sleep with what he called his visions. Little extravagant pieces of imagination in which Bickley was always a person of supreme importance. Sometimes it was Bickley the great painter or Bickley the great composer. Regardless of the role, he was always great, always a hero. He'd pull up his knees under the blanket, snuggle his head deeper into the pillow, and then say to himself, Well, what shall we do tonight? I think I'll play for England. I think I'll beat Australia. Bickley, the great cricket player, was his favourite vision. Had bat for more than ten hours. Amazing! Australia trying every bowler they had. No use. The man's too good. The match went on and on until Bickley had broken the world's record by scoring 501 runs. Stupendous! At the finish, he was carried from the field on the shoulders of his fellow players, the idol of the cheering thousands, the man of the hour, but always smiling and modest, when the Prime Minister said solemnly, Bickley, you have saved England. Well, naturally, by this time, Bickley was fast asleep. But those wild thoughts he had when his head was in the gooseberry bush formed the basis of a new vision. He saw himself, the respected physician of Wyvern Cross, dignified, light-hearted, strolling happily down the highway of life without a care in the world, without worry, without Julia. But how could I manage it? How could I kill her? How? Without risk. How could I kill her? How? How? How could I kill her? For nights and nights he did not play cricket once. Then an extraordinary thing happened. A thing that got poor old Bickley mixed up more than ever. He fell in love. She was a newcomer to Wyvern Cross, a Miss Madeline Cranmere, who'd taken up residence at the old hall, a huge castle-like affair on the hill. She was a girl of about 23, not pretty in the least, except for her blue eyes, which were quite beautiful. Bickley had never met her, until the afternoon he was summoned to the hall professionally and very hastily. 
Dr. Bickley. I'm Madeline Cranmere. So sorry to keep you waiting. Not at all, Miss Cranmere. I've spent a very enjoyable few minutes looking over the hall. I've never been up here before. It's beautiful, isn't ah, it? Ah, lovely. Perfect example of old Tudor. Oh, yes. I wouldn't know. Oh, absolutely. That carved over mantel, for instance, quite authentic. And uh, fortunately not spoiled by restoration. How interesting. You seem to know a lot about that sort of thing. Oh, no. Before you leave, I must show you the whole place. That's very kind. <laughs> not really. Actually, it'll be you who'll be showing me. <laughs> Will you have tea, Doctor? Tea? Well, uh... Please do. Uh, Vera? Yes, sir? Dr. Bickley will stay for tea. Dr. Bickley stayed quite late for tea. They talked of a hundred things, art mostly. It came out quite naturally that Dr. Bickley sketched a bit, or tried to. And Miss Cranmere was positive he must do wonderful work. From art, they passed to other topics, and it was amazing how identical were their views. There wasn't a lull in the conversation until almost six o'clock. Well, I suppose I should be running. Yes. I've had a most enjoyable afternoon. Shall I confess something, Doctor? I haven't spoken to anyone like this in... in weeks. You see, I live here by myself, except for the servants, of course. Already I'm finding life a little lonely. Oh. But you're coming back to sketch the hall. You promised. It's a privilege, Miss Cranmere. Well? Uh... Well? Oh, uh, Miss Cranmere, you called this afternoon. I mean, the message you left at the house. Oh, oh, yes. I don't sleep well, Doctor. Hmm. Any particular reason you can think of? No. Just nerves, I think. You know. Of course. <laughs> High strung. I suppose I am. Well, we shall certainly have to take care of that. I'll write a prescription at once. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Bickley came away from the hall that evening, and other evenings too, feeling ten years younger. These nights, as Bickley snuggled into his pillow to begin the happy journey into imagination, he had a new vision to lull him to sleep. Not merely life without Julia, but life with Madeline Cranmere. Madeline Cranmere always at his side. Madeline Cranmere smiling beautifully, always helpful and understanding. Madeline Cranmere, his life companion, his soul mate. Madeline the fair, Madeline the lovable, Madeline the lily maid. That girl, Madeline Cranmere, is getting herself talked about. Yeah, uh, what's that, Julia? You must have heard me, Edmund. You weren't asleep. You were sighing. Are you in pain? Uh, no, no, no. I uh, suppose I've been thinking. I said that Madeline Cranmere is getting herself talked about. Really? Well, people around here will talk about anyone. I don't mind them talking about her. But I don't like to see the Bourne family name dragged in the mud. Bourne? Denny Bourne. He's been seen up there several times lately. You mean they're, they're talking about her and Denny Bourne? Don't shout at me, Edmund. What's the matter with you? Well, well, I think it's abominable. Just because a young man has tea once or twice with a young lady, I... Lord, beats me how these things get about. But they do get about, Edmund. And other things, too. Huh? Uh, so it seems. Is Miss Cranmere in good health, Edmund? Why, I imagine so. Then why do you have to see her every other day? Now, look here, Julia. If you're insinuating Keep that I... Keep your voice down. I have a violent headache. You needn't bother to pretend with me, Edmund. I know you too well. Normally, I don't interfere with your amusements. But in this case, I warn you, I will not permit it. Julia, I won't stand this sort of thing, even from you. You don't know the first thing about Miss Cranmere. If you think for one moment that Edmund, she's... Edmund, do you imagine yourself in love with this girl? No, I... No, I do not. I think your beastly insinuations Thank are... you. I have no wish to hear. Now, will you kindly give me something for this headache? It's horrible. Julia... And in future, I... will you please stay away from the hall? This was awkward. Bickley had to go up to the hall that next afternoon. Otherwise, he couldn't finish that portrait he was making of Madeline. He certainly found himself between the devil and her deep blue eyes. Is it finished yet? In a moment. Uh, just turn toward the light again, Miss Cranmere. Yeah, that's it. Now, if I could just... 
Oh, Lord. What is it? It's no good. I can't get at you. Not the real you. I'll throw it in the fire. No, please. May I see it? If you want to. But it's not good, really. Hmm. Clever. You really think so? I say that. It's wonderful to hear you say that. Very clever. Oh, I say. I don't see what you mean by not being able to get me. I think it's exactly like me. Oh, yes, it's like you, but that isn't the point. I was trying to get at you. I mean, show where you differ from everyone else. I mean, your expression. Hmm. The way you hold your head, that, that lovely, deep look in your eyes. Your wonderful, wonderful... I think I understand. Madeline, I suppose you know what I'm doing? Yes, I know. I'm making love to you. Yes. Madeline. Oh, Edmund. Edmund, please go. Go at once. Not now. Oh, please. Don't you see how wrong it is? How stupidly, inalterably wrong. You have a wife, Edmund. Yes. Yes, I have a wife. That night in bed, Whitley had the most important of all his visions. He began to see very clearly how Julia would die. Murder is a serious business. The tiniest slip may be disastrous. It was Julia herself who put the final plan into his mind. For the past five years, Julia had been subject to headaches, which the doctor sometimes treated with a mild injection of morphine. The first part of his plan was almost childlike in simplicity. He would give Julia her headaches with the aid of a drug he had read about in a medical journal. Corrective for uric acid diathesis. Drug is no longer used, not only because of its prohibitive price, but because it tends to produce violent headaches. Next morning and every other morning at breakfast thereafter, Julia received a generous dose of this drug sprinkled lightly over her grapefruit. It was certainly a bit of luck that Julia had a passion for grapefruit. Oh, dear, 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 dear. Well, I'll have to get along. Lots of cases this morning. Goodbye, Julia. Oh, dear. What's the matter? Headache. Oh, bad? Blinding. The worst ever. Oh. Well, perhaps you'd better lie down for a while. I'll look in on you at lunch. I can't lie down. It'll only be worse. You'd better give me something before you go, Edmund. Give you what, my dear? Whatever it is you always give me. I can't stand this. Julia, I've thought for a long time that these headaches of yours were just the result of being, well, run down. Now it looks to me like something organic. Well, what? That I can't say. But if they go on, I shall have to take you to see a specialist. You'll do nothing of the kind, Edmund. The headaches went on and the treatment went on. Headaches, morphine, headaches, morphine. By the middle of January, Julia was getting a good five grains a day. So far, so good. Oh, Dr. Bickley. Come in, Doctor. Is Miss Cranmere at home, Vera? Yes, sir. She's in the drawing room with Mr. Bourne. Oh, Bourne. Dr. Bickley, good afternoon. Miss Cranmere? Well, how are you, Bickley? How do you do? Danny's just leaving. You won't stay for tea, Danny? I'm sorry, I can't. Well, Miss Cranmere's been showing me your sketches, Bickley. They're not bad. Thanks. You must like the old place up here. Very interesting, architecturally. Only trouble with these old places is that they're not very sanitary. How's that? Plumbing's very bad. Oh, Dr. Bickley, really? Well, it is. Regular typhoid trap up here. Doctor! Well, thank you, Miss Cranmere. I've had a marvellous afternoon. Come again soon, Danny. Right. Dr. Bickley? Afternoon. Edmund, that wasn't very clever of you. Wasn't it? What's he doing up here? I don't like him. Come and sit down, Edmund. You haven't answered me, Madeline. This is the tenth time I've run into him in the last month. Edmund, are you so blind? Blind to what? 
All I see is that you've constantly encouraged Danny Bourne to make this place a sort of... Of course I've encouraged him. Because of you, Edmund, don't you see? I have to let him come. I don't mind people talking about him and me. Let them say what they want. But I couldn't stand it if... If they talked about us, Edmund. Madeline, forgive me. <laughs> darling, don't ever be cross with me, please, darling. Madeline. I don't think you realize how difficult it is, Edmund. A girl like me in love with a married man. I know. It's difficult for me, too. I've tried to think it out clearly. I, I even spoke to Julia. When? Oh, a long time ago. You told her about us? No, no, certainly not. I should hope you wouldn't. What did you say to her? I asked her for a divorce. She wouldn't give it to you? She refused, absolutely. You see, Edmund. You see how hopeless it is. No. No, it isn't hopeless. Give me time, that's all. Time? I seem to have a great deal of time, don't I? Madeline, look at me. You love me, don't you? You know I do, Edmund. How much do you love me? Edmund, what a strange question. How can you ask? Because I've got to know. I've got to know, Madeline. I love you more than I could ever tell. Thank you, Madeline. Well, that satisfied Bickley, but he realized now he'd better get a move on. My dear, I can't do it. I just can't. I merely asked for relief, Edmund. But I gave you a grain, my dear, just before dinner. I know. Now my head's worse than ever. But it can't go on, Julia. What can't? All this morphia. Very bad for you, you know. You... Well, you're coming to rely on us. Will you kindly put what you mean into plain words, Edmund? Well, to put it bluntly, it'll become a habit. If you're hinting that I'll become a drug fiend... Really, Edmund, what nonsense. Kindly come to the surgery and give me an injection at once. No. If you want any more injections, you... You'll have to change your doctor. I can't administer any more. For your own sake, Julia. Well, that night, Julia slept very soundly. Bickley crept slowly down the stairs to the surgery. Quietly, he opened the drawer which contained the morphia serene. Hmm. It had recently been used. Julia was following the course prescribed. She was now addicted to morphine, self-administered. Part one of the plan was complete. Now for part two. He sent a letter to Julia's brother and sister in a nearby town. Just what is this all about, Edmund? Is Julia ill? I'm afraid it's more serious than that, Hilda. Well, let's hear the worst and get it over with. What's the matter with Julia? Well, not easy for me to tell you this. But I felt as her brother and sister, you had a right to know. Julia's... She's addicted to morphine. Morphine? But you mean Julia takes dope? While you're visiting here, make some excuse to see her forearm. You can manage it, Hilda. You'll notice that the arm's almost covered with tiny punctures. Morphine. It's incredible. A dope fiend. Well, that would be a nice thing to get around, wouldn't it? We'll have to keep this hushed up, Edmund. Naturally. But I wanted someone else to know. I, uh, I feel better somehow. You must admit that Bickley had done a very neat job up to now. By the time the brother and sister left, they were ready to swear that Julia was a drug addict. As he saw them to their car, Bickley was rubbing his hands in cheerful anticipation of the next step in the murder. He called it part three, the overdose. A few mornings later, Julia rose from breakfast with the worst headache ever. Bickley's face was almost comic in his effort to conceal his delight. This was the time, this was the day Julia would die. He locked up the morphine carefully, then went out on his morning calls. At noon, he returned home secretly to find Julia still suffering horribly. Good. He went to the surgery, unlocked the medicine cabinet, counted the grains of morphine into his hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine... 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 grains. Half would have been enough. Hurry, please, Edmund, yes, hurry. Yes, dear, yes, dear. With his gloved hands, he filled the syringe, surprised at the steadiness of his fingers. At the last moment, he had another flash of genius. Uh, will you hold this syringe a moment, Julia? Thank you. Oh, the clever devil. Her fingerprints on the cylinder. And then, in all fairness, we must say it, Bickley gave his wife one last chance. 
I'll take that syringe now. Julia, for some time past, I've wanted to ask you something. Will you reconsider your decision about divorcing me? No, Edmund, I will not. I'm not a child, Julia. I know my own mind. I'm in love with Madeline Cranmer. I've known it for months. And nothing would persuade me to divorce you for her. The girl's no good, Edmund, no good at all. That's absolutely final? Absolutely. Hold out your arm, Julia. Oh, thank you, Edmund. Go upstairs, Julia. Go up and lie down. Now, let's see, says Bickley. Julia will be dead in 20 minutes. No one knows you came home. Leave the house, go on your rounds, be seen on the street and establish that you were not here when the tragedy took place. Be seen, Dr. Bickley. She'll be dead in 20 minutes. Be seen in the village. Afternoon, Dr. Bickley. Good afternoon, Mrs. Wright. Dr. Bickley. Ah, oh, Mrs. Templer, lovely afternoon. Lovely. Good afternoon, Doctor. Benji, how's your leg? Oh, perfect. Good. Afternoon, Mrs. Cheevy. Uh, Mrs. Harford, lovely day, isn't it? At the precise moment that Julia left this world, Dr. Bickley was at the other end of the village, sounding old Mr. Tracy's heart. He wished Mr. Tracy's heart didn't sound so much like a clock ticking. It made him nervous. 20 minutes from 12.30. That's 10 minutes of one. She's dying. She's dying right now. Julia's dying. His heart is beating, living, beating. And hers is stopping, dying, stopping. Here, what's wrong, Doctor? Is the old ticker on the blinker? Oh, no, 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 Mr. Tracy. It's fine. You'll live, I think. Bickley didn't go home. Better let his maid make the discovery. What to do in the meantime? What about going up to the hall to see Madeline? When he arrived, he found another guest barring the doorway. It was Denny Bourne. I don't understand this, Denny. Where's Madeline? Isn't she here? Well, she isn't feeling well, that's all. She's up in her room, lying down. I'll go up and see her. I don't think you should. As a matter of fact, old boy, I think you'd better not come up here at all from now on. Really? And why not? Well, it's only decent, you know. After all, with Madeline and I just becoming engaged... Engaged? You and Mad... Engaged? Well, then she didn't tell you. Oh, she promised she would. I don't believe it. Why, you young oh, fool... Oh, no, let's not. After all... Get out of my way. Now, see here. Get out of my way! Madeline. Edmund, you shouldn't have tried to see me. Madeline, look here. This is all nonsense, of course. No, Edmund, it isn't. I've thought it all out. We couldn't go on. You don't love Denny Bourne. You couldn't. Edmund. Listen to me. This is what you're going to do. Edmund, my shoulder. You're hurting me. Listen. You're going downstairs this minute and break this thing off. Tomorrow I'm going to London to buy a special license. You're coming with me. We'll be married. In three days we'll be married. Let me go. Are you mad, Edmund? You have a wife. A wife. My wife is dead. Dead. Denny. 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 Shut up. Denny. Shut up, do you Denny. hear? Denny. Denny. <laughs> Dr. Pickley. Dr. Pickley, sir. Vera, Miss Cranmer's hysterical. Get me some cold water. Yes, sir, but the telephone, sir. You want it at once. It's Mrs. Pickley, sir. She's... Oh, it's very bad news, sir. I... I'll take the call. Oh, Dr. Bickley, what have you done? Have you put a noose around your neck, Doctor? You were not supposed to know your wife was dead. You hadn't been home. Are those nights and nights of wonderful visions to be wasted? Thrown away by one careless word? Oh, Dr. Bickley, how could you? There you have the first episode of Malice Aforethought. We'd like to leave you with one more fact which makes us feel that this series is destined for a really outstanding success. 
That is, the popular appeal of the psychological mystery, the box office success of Alfred Hitchcock's psychological mystery films. Here are some of them. Rebecca, Spellbound, 39 Steps, Suspicion, Foreign Correspondent, The Lady Vanishes, all names known throughout the country to millions of movie-going Americans. The consistent success of the Hitchcock films is not accidental. It is based on two things. One, Hitchcock's creative genius as a director and interpreter. Two, and this we believe is important to you, the obvious trend of public interest today in the psychological mystery. I'm terribly sorry we're not able to finish the story this week. As Bickley might say, telling a murder story is a serious business and it takes a little time. Please bear with us and just wait until next week and let's see what happened to old Bickley. You think he'll get away with it? I wonder. This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company.